Today we're going to talk about relative motion. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's that frame of reference thing. It's the relative to what thing. Um, in grade 6, we talked about uh, over the last week or so, in grade 1, you learned to add scalars together. In grade 6, you learned to add vectors together, but you learned to add vectors together when they were in one dimension. So, in other words, maybe you had a north and a south, or maybe you had an east and a west, but they were all on the same axis, all on the same plane. We can add those together, we can get a total resultant vector. Um, we could do relative motion in one dimension, because relative motion really depends only upon a vector addition. I'll give you an example of a problem that you could have solved in grade 6 with, the, with the, the vector addition skills that you had at that point. Say you're in an airplane, and that airplane is traveling at 800 kilometers per hour. And you're, you get up to go to the bathroom in that airplane. And when you walk in that airplane, you're traveling relative to the airplane at 6 kilometers per hour. So the airplane is going at 800 relative to the ground. and you are going at 6 relative to the airplane. What is your velocity relative to the ground? This is the grade 6 question, remember, Dom? 806 kilometers per hour. How many people agree with that? Sounds good, right? How many people think it could be something different? What could it be? Or Good, good. Maybe you're going to the bathroom in the back of the airplane, and you're going opposite to the direction of the airplane, you're still moving in the direction of the airplane relative to the ground at a big rate, but not quite as fast, right? Relative to the ground, you'd be going at 794 kilometers per hour, right? So, Dom, you could be right, depending upon the directions here, or you could be right, depending upon the directions here. So it could be either one. Bottom line is, to find the relative motion, the velocity of you, when you get up to go to the bathroom, relative to the ground, you did vector addition. You said 800 plus 6, or you said 800 plus minus 6. You added vectors together. Does that make sense? What if you were, what if you were with your family? There's five people in your family, let's say, three people on one side of the aisle, two people on the other side of the aisle. You get up all of a sudden when the plane was moving at 800 kilometers per hour, and you walked across the aisle. You weren't walking against the airplane or with the airplane. You were walking across the aisle with the airplane. How would you find your velocity relative to the ground then? Well, relative motion or relative velocity is always found by adding vectors. But when we add vectors in that case, we're adding vectors in two dimensions, just like we've been doing over the last week or so. Does that make sense? So in other words, what you do is draw a vector diagram, you complete a, a right-angled triangle vector diagram, find the hypotenuse of that triangle, and then you'd use the inverse tan function to find the angle, and then you'd say, you know, north of west, or whatever the case may be. Uh, before we get too far, let's just write down a couple things with what we've, what we've just said here. I changed the example a little bit here because I thought, ah, you know what, this one probably isn't the safest thing in the world. It's probably better to get up and walk to the bathroom in an airplane than throw a baseball while you're in an airplane. That, that might be a quick way to get yourself arrested if you throw a baseball at 100 kilometers per hour in an airplane. Let's say you did, however, do that. You throw it at 100 kilometers per hour, the relative velocity of the baseball, the velocity relative to the ground, would either be 900 kilometers per hour or... 700 kilometers per hour, depending upon which direction you threw the baseball. Does that make sense? Or if you threw it across the aisle, which it's bad news to throw a baseball like to the road, the front of the airplane, it's even worse to throw it at 100 kilometers per hour across the aisle. If you did that, then you'd have to add vectors together again, but you'd have to add them together as a right angle vector triangle. So what do we got to do to get the uh, resultant vector there? Of course, we've got to add the vectors together. 800 plus 100 is 900. 800 plus negative 100, if the direction is opposite, is 700. We've got to add the vectors to get the velocity relative to the ground. That's not rocket science. Okay? We all know that at some level, without taking physics, we could have probably found that. Now, when we're analyzing relative motion in two dimensions, we've got to do essentially the same thing. We have to add the vectors together. 
but we're adding the vectors together in two dimensions, which means we've got to get a vector diagram, specifically a right angle triangle vector diagram, a three vector right angle triangle vector diagram. Then what do we do with that? Well, we do the hypotenuse. We get the hypotenuse by taking the Pythagorean theorem, and then we get the angle by taking the inverse tan function. So, 100 plus, nine, plus 800 might be 900, it might be 700, or it might be some other number altogether, depending upon whether you threw that baseball forward or backwards or across the aisle, right? Depending upon whether it's one-dimensional or two-dimensional. Now, we're adding these vectors together in two dimensions. We're going to follow a couple rules that's going to help us through this process. We're going to have three vectors in every diagram. Two of those vectors are going to be what I call solid line vectors. One of them is going to be a dotted line vector. Solid line vectors are vectors that contribute to my overall velocity, my relative velocity, my velocity relative to the ground. They contribute to that. The dotted line vector is that actual velocity, the velocity relative to the ground. So, for instance, if I'm flying in an airplane directly north, I'm aiming to the north in my airplane. I'm the pilot of the plane, and I'm aiming to the north. I'm aiming to Edmonton. Why I'd want to go to Edmonton, I don't know. But um, Let's say I'm aiming towards Edmonton. But there's a wind that's taking me off course, a wind that's blowing me to the east. Maybe I end up in Lloydminster. Maybe I'd be a really poor pilot if I was trying to go to Edmonton and I ended up in Lloydminster. But get, get the idea. If there's a wind that takes me off course, right? the way I aim is a vector. The, the wind is a vector. The way that I aim contributes to where I actually go. So that would be a solid line vector. The wind also contributes to where I actually go. Now, where I actually go is my dotted line vector. So the wind in where I aim would be solid line vectors. Where I actually go, that is that vector that goes from Okotoks to Lloydminster, would be my dotted line vector. Solid line vectors contribute to where I go. Dotted line vectors are where I actually go, my velocity relative to the ground. Give you some examples of solid line vectors here. Where I aim, or where I head, the captain of a ship heads directly east across the lake. The pilot of a plane heads or aims directly south towards Lethbridge. The wind speed is 28 kilometers per hour to the west. The river current is 10 kilometers per hour to the south. River current would contribute to where you go, right? You try to swim across a river and there's a current? Well, it takes you off course. The river current contributes to where you end up going. That would be a solid line vector. The airspeed, that's a tricky one. The airspeed, the speed in still air. Do you know what I do when I get on an airplane? I don't, I'm actually, in Air Canada, I don't think they do this on a WestJet, but on Air Canada they do. You look at that magazine, and you flip to the back of the magazine, and they have a, uh, pictures of all the airplanes they fly. And they have statistics, numbers, about that airplane, about each of those airplanes. I always look at those airplanes as they're going through the safety thing. And I should probably watch the safety thing, but I've seen it enough times that I feel like, okay, you know, make, make sure you put that oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on somebody else. And use your seat as a flotation device, which, by the way, if you ever crash in the ocean, using your seat as a flotation device, I don't know about that, but um, that's what they say, right? We know all that stuff, so I look at the back of that magazine as they're doing the safety, the safety stuff. And I read those numbers. I don't know why. It entertains me, whatever. And it talks in that magazine about the airspeed of each of these airplanes. The airspeed of this airplane, maximum airspeed might be 900 kilometers per hour. The maximum airspeed of this one might be 860 kilometers per hour or 830 kilometers per hour. The airspeed is how fast the airplane can go if there is no wind or if there's no other factors. In the absence of everything else, that's how fast it can go. Do you know what? That contributes to where you go. The fact that this 737 jet can travel at 830 kilometers per hour without a wind contributes to where you go. 
It's got it, right? The wind contributes as well, but its maximum airspeed contributes. So the airspeed, how fast it can go without a wind, or for a boat, I guess it would be the speed in still water, like in the middle of a lake without a wind or without a current, okay, that contributes to where we actually go as well. Solid line vectors. Now the other ones are dotted line vectors. When the airplane or the ship or the boat, whatever, actually goes in a certain direction. I actually go to Edmonton in my car. I actually go to Regina in a plane. Those are dotted line vectors. They're not what contributes to where I go. They are where I go. Solid line vectors contribute to where I go. Dotted line vectors are where I go. Or where I want to go. You ever find that? How many people have the driver's license here? Okay, lots of you, actually. You ever find this? We get these crazy Chinooks around here sometimes, and sometimes the wind gets crazy, like, you know, 90, 100 kilometers per hour. And you're driving your car in the middle of this crazy windy day, this crazy windy Chinook, and you're trying to go to Calgary, directly north. You ever notice your steering wheel sometimes is turned like this as you try to go directly north to Calgary? You ever notice that? I mean, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you guys know that you have to kind of steer into the wind, right? Where I'm aiming my car over there towards, maybe towards uh, Bragg Creek, I'm aiming towards Bragg Creek, I'm trying to go to Calgary, where I'm aiming would be a solid line vector. Where I want to go directly north towards Calgary is the dotted line vector. The wind contributes to where I go. Where I have my steering wheel turned contributes to where I go. Solid line vectors north towards Calgary is where I actually go, or at least where I want to go. Another one that we can consider to be a solid line vector would be the ground velocity, or the velocity of the boat, the velocity of the ship, the velocity of the plane, the velocity of the car relative to the ground. Solid line vectors, dotted line vectors. It's important to keep these straight because they're what allow us to draw relatively simple okay, three vector right angle triangle vector diagrams. We get those right, the rest of the problem is easy. Now the good news is you don't necessarily have to memorize those. Okay, again, let's think about it. Let's think about solid line vectors as being vectors that contribute to where we want to go. Dotted line vectors are where we actually go. So if you can't remember whether the wind speed is a solid or a dotted, don't worry about it. Think about it. Does the wind contribute to where I go, or is the wind direction where I go? If the wind is blowing east, do I go east, or does that east wind just contribute to my motion? Well, it just contributes to my motion, therefore it's a solid line vector. You use your hand up there? Nope. Here's one example, last thing we're going to do today. Because the pilot of a plane heads directly north to Edmonton at a velocity of 200 kilometers per hour. So it's a small plane. Okay, it's not a big uh, 737 heading to Edmonton. But there's a wind speed of 50 kilometers per hour blowing to the east. That's pretty significant. Where does the plane actually go? So you're aiming towards Edmonton. doesn't mean you actually want to go to Edmonton. You're aiming towards Edmonton. Maybe you want to go there. Maybe you want to go somewhere else. We don't know. Okay. But in the end, that's where you're heading. There's a wind at 50 kilometers per hour. Where do we go? Okay, we got a vector north at 200 kilometers per hour. Is that a solid line or a dotted line vector? Does that contribute to where we go, or is that where we go? It contributes. So if it's going to be a solid line vector, right? Let's draw that. 200 kilometers per hour. Okay, we, we're drawing velocity vectors now. 20 minutes ago, we were drawing displacement vectors. Is that okay? Sure, we could draw force vectors, momentum vectors. You never even heard of momentum. We could draw any vector we want. 
200 kilometers per hour is my first solid line vector. Then we got a wind at 50 kilometers per hour blowing to the east. Does that 50 kilometer per hour wind to the east contribute to where I go, or is that where I go? It contributes. So we got a 50 to the east. Now I got to combine these because I've got to add them up, right? You throw a baseball at 100 kilometers per hour in an airplane that's traveling 800, you had to add those up. 800 plus 100 is 900 or 700. Well, 200 plus 50 is what? Not 250. 200 plus 50 is, gives me my resultant velocity or my velocity relative to the ground or where the plane actually goes. That's my dotted line vector. Let's find the value of that dotted line vector where I actually go. I get 206 kilometers per hour. So what we're saying here is this. The plane can only go 200 kilometers per hour, but the wind can make it go 206. Is that possible? Of course it's possible, guys. Of course it's possible. Anybody who runs track here might know that if you've at least watched track on TV, um, 100 meter, 100 meter sprint. Okay, to, to set a world record in a 100 meter sprint, there has to be um, less than a certain wind at your back. The reason being that if 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 you can if you can run at a maximum speed of 15 meters per second, but there's a wind of of three meters per second, then that can make you go faster, right? So a wind can make you go faster than what you could run without the wind. The wind can make the airplane go faster as well. Even if the wind isn't necessarily in the same direction, it can make it go faster, at least a little bit faster here. So the airplane's traveling at 206 kilometers per hour. Where? Where? What direction? Well, the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent, 50 over 200, gives me an angle of 14 degrees. So where does the plane actually go? Well, it goes 206 kilometers per hour. It goes faster at 14 degrees. 14 degrees what of what? Where's that angle measured from, Merrick? It's going to be east of north, right? The angle is measured from the north here, and it's east from north. Right? It's, we're going north and we're going east, okay, but it's measured from the north, not from the east. So it's 14 degrees east of north. Now, this is a pretty basic problem. This is a fairly elementary navigation problem, but you can maybe start seeing a little bit how if you're a pilot or the captain of a ship or something like that, it might be useful to know a little bit about vectors. It might be useful to be able to deal with the wind when you're flying an airplane or when you're piloting a ship, right? Here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, I gave you a worksheet here uh, a little while ago. I would like you to do right now, please, for me, and for homework if you don't finish this up in class over the next few minutes. Please try the first two questions. That's it. Questions one and two on that worksheet. We'll take a look at those tomorrow. We'll do a little bit more with these and do some questions that are a little bit more complicated than this. And then we'll move on. All right, that's it for today, guys. Okay, you got the last few minutes to work on this now. As I say, just make sure they're finished up for tomorrow, please.